Well, let's get our Bibles out this morning and turn to Matthew chapter 5. Uh, Matthew chapter 5 as we continue in our series, Real Talk. Uh, the message this week is entitled, The D Word. As we uh, work our, th- our way through the uh, Sermon on the Mount, you know, one could ask the question, so based on what does Jesus have the authority to even teach these things? Why, why do we even care? Because um, he's hitting on some things that are kind of personal and um, uh, somewhat disruptive maybe even to our walk if we're self-centered and wanting what we want all the time. So why does Jesus get to do this? And uh, I think you just heard it in the last three songs we sang. Uh, John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now that is Jesus Christ. And so the one who is speaking in Matthew 5 is speaking with that authority. Now the one who paid it all. The one who was the sacrifice that was sufficient for my salvation. He is the one who is teaching. And he is the one who has the authority. And therefore we need to listen very carefully to what Jesus Christ says. The message is the D word. The D word. Sue and I, as we're doing a premarital counseling, virtually with every couple, uh, we tell them, don't say this word. It's never part of an argument. It's never part of anger. It's never part of, and that's the word divorce. Divorce is not in the language of a believer as far as talking to one another about what we might do. It's interesting as I uh, do uh, weddings, and I've had my fair share around here in the last few years, I say something like this. Marriage was instituted by God, the creator, who made us male and female. It's a symbol of the union between Christ and his church. Marriage is designed for the lifelong companionship, help, and comfort of husband and wife. The commitment of marriage is therefore not to be entered into lightly or carelessly, but thoughtfully and prayerfully and in the fear of God. So as you look at a message entitled The D Word, uh, you your Bibles open, I trust, to Matthew 5. Let's stand together. We're only going to read two verses, but Matthew 5, verses 31 and 32. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, this is your word, and we hold it in our hands. And Father, um, your word is not popular in our world ever because it shows the enmity between God and man. But Lord, even some things that Jesus taught and that we have uh, heard and seen, and Father, we struggle with them because our world is so different and we hear so many different voices about these things. And so Lord, as we hear a message today on the topic of divorce, I pray God that you would be honored, you would be glorified. It's not an easy message to preach and for some it won't be an easy message to hear. And so Lord, I pray that you would work in your church today that your spirit would work in our hearts and our lives, that you would give us ears to hear and minds to understand, and then passionate hearts, God, for, from where we are right now in our lives to drive a stake in the ground to move forward for the glory of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, you can take your seats. Well, it's interesting that uh, Jesus just moves right on from last week's topic of lust and adultery And then he starts out with, it was also said. And so it's just like, here we go, and we're going to keep on going. And uh, so that's what we're going to do, because that's what we do around here. It's God's word. We don't leave parts out. We just preach uh, right through, and we want to do it with sensitivity and caring. But, you know, I was thinking about this. Jesus sat down when he taught um, his followers, and I thought about what are the things that God hates? What are the things that God hates? Now, God hates sin for sure, right? In a general sense, that's true. God hates sin. But there are some specific things that the Bible says that that God hates. A list of them are found in Proverbs, in uh, Proverbs chapter uh, 6 and um, verses 16 to 19. And uh, I'm going to flip back there and uh, read those for you. It says in Proverbs 6, 
There are six things that the Lord hates. Seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes. A lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked plans. Feet that make haste to run evil. A false witness who breathes out lies. And one who sows discord among the brothers. And so um, as the proverb is being written, it says there are six things that God hates. And then there's one that he hates on steroids. Um, and so um, here's where they are. Haughty eyes. God hates haughty eyes. That's prideful looking down on someone, forgetting the fact that anything good in you is a result of God. God hates it when we look down on other people. A lying tongue. It speaks of falsehood knowingly and willingly with intent. A lying tongue can be used to impugn someone's character. It can also be used to flatter someone. God hates a lying tongue. God hates hands that shed innocent blood. This refers to cold-blooded murder, but we even see in this text that what you do in your heart, God hates it. God hates a heart that devises wicked plans, thinking or conceiving evil against another individual or a group. Uh, what you're thinking about at home, what you're wrestling with in your life, and God hates a heart that devises wicked plans. God hates feet that make haste or are quick to run into evil. It means quick to rush into evil um, without displaying any resistance whatsoever for sin. God hates that. God hates false witnesses who breathe out lies. It's different than lying because here it's used in a court that could send someone who is innocent to jail or even to death. God, God hates people who breathe false witness. And then the bonus one that Proverbs gives us is that uh, God hates one who sows discord among the brothers. Wow. Oh, that one strikes at home in the church. Someone who's nattering, trying to tear somebody else down, trying to pull down a group in the church, trying to. God hates that. Hates, that's a strong word. And there's one more thing that the Bible says that God hates, and it's, it's found in uh, Malachi chapter 2, verse 16. In the New American Standard Bible, it says, for I hate divorce, says the Lord. I hate it. Every time a Christian couple gets divorced, God is in heaven. I hate that. I hate it. The English Standard Version doesn't use that specific word, but rather it describes God's disdain. So as we talk about divorce today, we're talking about something that God hates. And therefore, it's something that we should take note of and sit up straight and listen carefully to because this is big on the list of things that are important to God. And so I want to take a look at a number of things. And uh, the first thing I want to take a look at is the difficulty of the teaching. The difficulty of the teaching. Uh, according to the Bible, marriage is a lifetime commitment. The Bible says, so they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. And so the concept of marriage is one man with one woman, as long as God gives you breath. Uh, but the reality is, as people look at Scripture and look at Scripture on this particular topic, um, so often we end up with a convenient theology instead of a biblical theology. And God is calling us to be biblical about this, but it's difficult teaching because there are many different views. It's difficult teaching because of the pain of hurting people. And just as I did last week when I talked about adultery and talked about lust, I, I need to give a word of sensitivity in all of this as well. Because I have a responsibility to preach, thus saith the Lord, to be true to what God's word says. But at the same time, to realize people who are in the room, who maybe were the innocent party in this, and just the thought of hearing another message on divorce, they wondered if I'm even going to go to church this week. And so I want to be careful, and I want you to know that we love you, and we care for you, and we desire God's best for you. And there isn't any other person in the room, there's no one in the room that is not without sin, without our struggle, 
And so I want to be careful as we preach this message to be sensitive to people who maybe are hurting. You were dragged in this. It wasn't your desire. And, or maybe you're here today and you're going to learn some things and it's like what, what I did was wrong. And, uh, and I want to be sensitive to that because there's forgiveness and there's restoration with repentance and all of that's available for God's children, but it doesn't undo the fact that God hates divorce. It's a difficult teaching because of the dead world that we live in. The world doesn't even care about this. You get married two, three, four times, who cares? Doesn't matter. So the teaching we have is another thing, again, is counter our culture, and that we're going to stand on God's word. It's a difficult teaching because it always involves sinful behavior. Divorce always involves sinful behavior. And so we have a difficult teaching. We also have the destruction that it causes. A divorce leaves a path of destruction. Um, And so the teaching of Jesus in divorce is not to hurt us, but rather to protect us. And so this teaching is for the protection of God's children but there's destruction that's caused and virtually in every, every divorce, these things are impacted. Here's the first one, the relationship with God with those who are involved, a husband and a wife. The relationship with God is hurt when divorce happens. Uh, the person who is the guilty party in this, and we want to phrase it that way, uh, they went on a journey of a breakdown in relationship with God long before adultery ever happened or long before a divorce ever happened. And their relationship with God it somehow maybe went from something that was good to something that just stinks and they didn't get to a good place. And their relationship with God is affected. Sue and I met with a couple this week who are going through some serious, serious things in, in their marriage right now. The reality is we were talking to the one spouse. The, the one spouse said, it, it's making me question God. Uh, how could God let this happen to me? Why did God do this to me? Why did? And losing sight of it's the sin of your partner. And God will work this out, and God will work for his glory, but that person's relationship was rocked. The destruction it causes in your relationship with God, the the destruction it causes in the spouse who one day sits down with another spouse and hears of unfaithfulness, and they think their heart is going to pound right out of their chest, and the anger that builds up and just destruction. There's this destruction of the family, especially of the kids. People say, well, no, we're going to have an amicable divorce and it's all going to work out. And No, it's not. It might work out financially for you. It might work out for you to get on with your thing. And your kids are going to be impacted. And there's nothing you can do that's going to change this because this is not God's design for you. And so kids are filled with anger or they question their faith, or they even walk away from their faith but it's because they watched a mom and dad who loved Jesus and walked with him, and, and now they see this destruction that's happening, and they go, it was never real for you. Why would it be real for me? They might have physical issues like cutting, and promiscuity can result as a, resu- as a, re- as a result of a mom and dad have no rules. There's, there's no thus saith the Lord for them, and so... It can be a lack of discipline as parents are trying to impress their children. There can be disrespect. There can be playing of sides. There can be competing for love. Uh, Kids get spoiled. and, And at some point, they're in some ways forced to have to choose. You know, that was different last night because we didn't have a baby dedication last night. I held little Chloe in my arms. And I believe your marriage is as solid as any marriage in our church including my own. But you just think about that little girl and what happens if that thing doesn't work out for mom and dad. There's the impact on kids. There's the impact on the rest of family where in-laws are drawn in and other family members are drawn in and they're causing to choose sides and they're causing to, and it's, there's destruction in the extended family. 
There's financial implications and potentially financial ruins and the lawyers get rich and you get poor and people start hiding things and stealing things and not being truthful about things and financial ruin can result. Ultimately, there's the destruction that is caused to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to God's glory. Marriage for a life was God's idea. Ephesians 5 talks about the husband and the wife being one and how Christ is the head and, and the wife is, and so we have this picture of Christ and the church. And in divorce, that picture that God sets out, it's, it's destroyed. And God hates it. He hates it. You know, the reality is a divorce is a, a breakdown even of the picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What Jesus Christ did so that we could be called sons and children of God to make us one again. And, and that reality, why does Christ have the authority to teach this? Because of what he did for us. Because he came, because he died for us, because he paid a price. He's, his gift was sufficient. His sacrifice was the sufficient gift so I could have eternal life. And so we have this picture of the headship of Christ and the, and the bride, the groom, the bride, the church, and being one because of Christ's salvation for us. And I didn't earn it and I didn't deserve it and God gave it to me. All I had to do was receive the gift. And maybe that's your story today, and you're here, and you're like, ah, I didn't come to church to learn about divorce. I thought I was going to learn about Jesus today. Well, Jesus is the key picture in our marriage because he was the one who saved us. For by grace you are saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's a gift that comes from God, not of works, lest anyone should boast the destruction that is caused I'm not much for going off into little tangents on my messages. We tend to stick, stick right to what we're talking about, but I do want to make a little caveat and make a comment about something in the whole area of divorce, and it's in the area of abuse. It's in the area of abuse. I would say this, don't cover up the evil, sinful acts of a spouse. If you are being abused emotionally or mentally, you need to get help. You need to get to your small group leader, you need to get to the church. You need to talk with your spouse first about it, but you need to get help. And if you're being abused physically, you need to phone the police. You don't have to sit under that. You're not called to be a part of that. Well, I'm hoping it's gonna work out. If you're being abused physically, phone the police. I, I, don't everyone hear another story about I fell down the stairs. Abuse, it's pathetic. Any man that would hit his wife is pathetic. But virtually it's the other way and it cuts both ways, I know. Um, it doesn't honor the Lord and it's wrong and physical abuse needs to be reported and you need to be cared for. And whether it's you or your children, they need to be cared for. Um, and the church would certainly be a part of helping in that. Well, we have the difficulty of the teaching. We have the destruction caused, but now we need to get into the meat of, okay, so what was Jesus really talking about? And that's the declaration of Jesus in the Bible. Now look at verse 31. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. And so once again, in, in the way that the law was being interpreted by um, the religious leaders, they had lowered the bar. So they'd kind of made it so that everybody was gonna be okay. And, uh, and that was go what was going on here. It, the the uh, Mosaic permission for divorce in Deuteronomy 21 was granted because of the hardness of their hearts. We're going to come back to that. It was because of their sinfulness is why it was even considered in the first place. But in the day when Jesus is teaching this, uh, some of the rabbis had gone so far as you could divorce your wife literally for anything. Literally for anything. She burnt your eggs at breakfast. I'm done with you. Write a bill of divorce, and she's out. So that is the kind of thing that Jesus was speaking against. I don't believe most people would do it for that. Um, or, or we would all be single. It was wrong. 
It wasn't the heart of what the, the teaching was. and It wasn't the heart of what God's heart for us was. It pictures our relationship with him. And God hates it when divorce happens. But that was kind of the context of what was going on. And so the man, a woman couldn't do this, just saying. The man would write a written statement indicating that he divorced her. It was a domestic matter. It was quite common. And the woman's now out on the street and she has no support and she has no help. And so she would go out and she would get remarried. And that's when Jesus is saying, you're causing her to commit adultery. You're causing her to commit adultery. And any man who married a divorced woman committed adultery with her. Um, and so Jesus' explanation here is to help the hearers realize the ramifications of the decisions that they were making and how significant they were for him. And so in verse 32, he says, but I say to you, but I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, and he makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. A parallel passage to this in Matthew is in Matthew 19, verses 3 to 9. It says, And the Pharisees came up to him, and, and they tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? See, that's the, she burnt your breakfast thing. He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? So Jesus said, This is what God designed. He made the male and female and said, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they'll no longer two but one. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And he said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? And he said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery, causes her to commit adultery. An illegitimate divorce gives place to adultery. God doesn't recognize that divorce. It's possible for a person to get a divorce from the state, but not from God. The laws of the land let you get divorced for just about anything. And people trump their piece of paper. They come into church and say, I have a divorce. I want to get remarried. You have a way bigger question to ask. You may have a statement from the state, but do you have clearance from Almighty God? Because just because the state said it's okay doesn't say God is saying it's okay. And when you remarry, you commit adultery. In essence, you have more than one wife or more than one husband in God's eyes. Hard teaching, but truth from God's word. Christ teaches that divorce is an accommodation to man's sin that violates God's original purpose for the intimacy, unity, and permanency of marriage. I wrote this line down. I was thinking about it this week, and it was just because you can doesn't mean you should but just because you can doesn't mean you should. We're going to come back to that a, a number of times as we, as we go through this. Although Jesus did say that divorce is permitted in some situation, we must remember his primary point in this discourse is to correct what the Jews were saying, that you could get divorced for any reason. Anyway, you, you, you burnt the toast. I don't like the way you clean the house. You don't do the laundry right anymore. That's the point of what Jesus was making. He was making, you put the bar down here. That's not where God places the bar. It was allowed because of the hardness of your heart. Therefore, a believer should never consider divorce except in specific circumstances. And even those circumstances should only be pursued reluctantly if there is no other course left to take. I believe the New Testament gives grounds for divorce for two things. One is for sexual sin, allows, doesn't require, allows for sexual sin or, by, or for by des, de, desertion by an unbeliever. 
So the first one is found in the text we've been looking at, Matthew 5, 32 and Matthew 19, 9. And, and that term, sexual sin or adultery, was a, was a general term. It was a pretty broad term. It included things like homosexuality and bestiality and incest. When one partner violates the unity and intimacy of a marriage by sexual sin, they forsake the covenant and the obligation that they made to, with each other before Almighty God. And therefore, after all means are exhausted to bring the sinning partner to repentance, the Bible permits release for the faithful partner through divorce. It's not what God desires. It's not what God wants. But if there's no turning and there's no repentance, then God allows it. Sexual relations are an integral part of the, of the marital bond. It says the two will become one flesh. Therefore, any breaking of that bond by sexual relations it, it opens the door for what Jesus taught in these verses. The verse says, and marries another, indicates that there is remarriage allowed. The Bible doesn't talk about remarriage for the guilty party, but it seems to be pretty clear about for the person who was sinned against. It's not what you have to do but it is a possibility if everything else fails. It, it's like God offered this as a mercy for the one who was sinned against. And so the Bible talks about divorce and remarriage in the context of adultery for the person who was sinned against. But when there's no other means, and we want to come back to that in a second. The second reason for permitting divorce in Scripture is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verses 12 to 15. Here's what it says, to the rest I say, not I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. So the picture is of a couple that got married and somewhere down the road the woman got in invited to Harvest Bible Chapel to a Bible study, and she put her faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And so now you have a person who is, who is a believer who's married to an unbeliever. Scripture's clear they shouldn't be in that relationship if they're both, if, if the person was a believer before, you shouldn't be marrying somebody who is unsaved. So to the rest, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever, he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. The influence that they can have in their salvation is so important and, and should not ever be undermined. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. And then in verse 15, but if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save uh, your wife? And so we have this picture of an unsaved partner. And as long as they're willing to stay in the marriage, then you're responsible to stay in the marriage. You're responsible to live out your faith for Christ, that they would see Christ, and maybe one day they would come to Christ. Uh, but the, also the reality of that verse is that when you trust Jesus Christ, there's a part of you that you become enemies with each other. You have a person who is at enmity with God, and you're no longer at enmity with God. And they might get to the place of, yeah, you're, you're just a goody two-shoes now. I don't know what you think this means, but you, you're not the person who I married once upon a time. I'm out of here. And the Bible gives freedom in that. And I believe clearly the Bible teaches that there's room for divorce, and, and therefore I believe there's room for remarriage in that situation. But I think sometimes what gets lost in the debate about divorce is People are looking for how can I get out? And that's not what God desires first. 
What God desires first is how do I stay in? How can God work in this? Now, believe me, I don't understand your pain if you've been through this. Sue and I have been married for almost 38 years. I am hugely blessed. So I've never lived with the pain you might be feeling. I've never had that heart wrenched right out of my chest when you saw that person who you thought was faithful and living for the Lord and you find out the whole thing was a big fat lie, at least for a part of it. But just because you can, it doesn't mean you should. When adultery is committed, a couple can, through God's grace, learn to forgive and rebuild their marriage. Uh, we got illustrations in our church of where that's happened, and I'm not standing people up, I'm not, but amazing stories of how God has redeemed a thing, how God has worked in a situation, and their marriage is as strong or stronger than it ever was before because God was working in it. God hates divorce. Even if there's that, the sin that could cause it, he still hates it, and we have a responsibility here at Lovingly, we have a responsibility to do what God would have us do in this. By every means to come to a place of an act of forgiveness and a process of forgiveness and a movement to restoration and and so long as there is a repentant heart and a life that is desiring to make things right as unfair as it might seem we have a call to forgive and you're like, I, I just don't even think I can see that from where I am right now. And, and I, I appreciate that. But look at your own heart and your enmity between you and God and your hatred for him and your failure for him and his, how many times must I forgive? Seven times? Seventy times? Seven times? Thank you, Lord, as many times as it takes for me. And that God would give you the grace and the courage and the strength to trust him and work hard towards a restoration in your marriage. The Bible gives words of caution, strong words, even of condemnation. But the glory of God would be well suited if a person came to the place of, I'll trust you, Lord. I'm gonna do what's right. I'm gonna allow you to work. God, you're going to have to do it because I, I just, I'm so ready to walk out the door and that God would work and there would be restoration. And so I believe the scripture is pretty clear on what the grounds are for divorce and even for remarriage. Uh, but I have people who come into my office and uh, they say things like this. They say things like, um, I don't love him anymore. I just don't love him. The, the feeling is gone. Feelings, nothing more than feeling. They're gone. They're gone. And I, I just, yeah, I, I want a divorce. And you need to understand that doesn't meet the criteria. You want to, in God's face, do something he hates? Then you move ahead and get a divorce because you think you don't love him anymore. Usually the line that comes right after that is, I don't know if I ever really did love him. Liar, liar, you got married, you were all googly-eyed, you were all in love, you, you loved the whole thing, you couldn't spend more time with anyone else because you had to spend your time with them and it doesn't meet the criteria. It doesn't mean your marriage isn't in trouble, it doesn't mean you're not struggling, but you don't use the D word. You do the things that are gonna allow you to have a marriage that's restored but the feelings are gone. The feelings will come back if you do the right things and honor the Lord. I don't love him anymore. Eh. I was abused. I got huge sympathy in this one. But abuse in itself isn't, an ex isn't a reason for divorce. It might be a requiring of a separation it might be requiring of huge help. It might be the requiring of the police to be involved. Somebody might have to go to jail. 
but God's word doesn't say anything on this, and so it's silent, and so be careful when you're acting out of things where God's word doesn't say, and you make a thus saith the Lord, and you're like, well, no, I believe it's okay because this happened to me. Well, that's not good theology. That's not a good way to trust the Lord. Does it need to be fixed? It absolutely does. Do you need to be protected and your kids? Absolutely you do, and the church can have a part in that. But the Bible doesn't ever anywhere state that is a reason why you could get a divorce. How about this one? It's just too hard. It's just too hard. You don't understand the egghead that I ended up marrying. You just don't get it. Like that guy, that guy, he don't bring me flowers anymore. There's my songs, I got some songs for this song. Um, and it's just too hard now. It's just too hard. I, I'm giving up. Hey, God never gave up on you. And you don't give up on your marriage. It might be hard. And you might need help. But it's not grounds for divorce. He's not trying enough. He doesn't bring me flowers. He doesn't take me out like he used to do. He doesn't. then we need to learn to work on our marriages and we need to be accountable to each other and we need to grow in our faith and grow in our walk. And, but don't go and do something that God hates to fulfill the feeling that you might have. How about this one? Well, everybody else is doing it. Everybody else is doing it. Somebody came up and asked me the service last night because I said the uh, statistic that the marriage failures in the church is the same as marriage failures outside of the church. That's a lie. That's a lie. It's not true. Marriage of people who are seeking to follow the Lord. Do you know how many people get married or get divorced when God is on the throne in their marriage? Zero. None. Ever. It doesn't happen. It happens when God's not on the throne, when you're on the throne. Are there too many divorces in the, mar- in, in the church? You better believe there are. And strong teaching needs to be given about this. But it's not the same as the world. And don't let anybody tell you that it is. That's a lie. I told the folks last night, the guy who spoke to me, I said, I've done over 100 marriages in my ministry. I don't know of maybe more than one that aren't still married. Where at the end of the day, in one other case, it was like, I, at the end of it, I, maybe that guy wasn't saved. They're all still married. So you can quote all the statistics you want. All I've got is the statistics that I have in my own ministry. It's not because of who I am. It's because of those people and what their commitments are. They're still married. They're still going on with the Lord. Nobody's getting a divorce when God is on the throne. You know, a couple of other quick principles. There's no enduring relationships without forgiveness. And that's true even in the seriousness of this topic. And we need to come to the place where I'm going to allow God to be glorified. And when a failure, even for a biblical reason, happens, divorce is not the first option, but rather it's the last resort after everything else has been tried. There's the difficulty, there's the destruction, there's the declaration of Jesus Christ in the Bible, and then I wrote this, there's our desire to obey. Our desire to obey. And everybody in the room who is married, I think some of these things will will be foundational for you. You need to have these things. They need to be in your toolbox. Um, In my desire to obey, I will do what God wants me to do. Not what I want to do, not what society tells me to do, not what my friend over here who doesn't know the first thing from God's word tells me to do. I'm going to obey. I'll do what God's word says to do. That's going to be the priority in my marriage. That's going to be how I'm going to make my decision. That's the first thing. The second thing, I will hate divorce and the idea of it as God does. This is a God hates it thing. And therefore, I'm going to hate it. And so I'm going to do everything to see God get the glory in my marriage. That's your passion. I'm going to focus on the Word. I'm going to focus on what God's Word says. I'm going to be in it. And on this topic, I'm not going to, I'm not going to make my theology fit my circumstances. 
but I'm going to come to what God's word says and I'm going to live out of that. Even if that meant making the decision after a divorce, you know what? One of the options is you don't get remarried. One of the divorces is, uh, options is that you live singly for the Lord and for his glory. That's found in the 1 Corinthians 7 passage. But you might be here and you're in a situation and you're listening to all this and you go, um, I didn't know. I didn't know. I crossed those lines. I didn't know. What do I do? You come to the Lord in confession. You come to the Lord in repentance. And then you move on in your life. Because God forgives our sin. Well, what if it happened before I was saved? I don't believe you're under these things. It was before you were saved. Now you're saved. Lived like a saved person. You didn't have Christ and the church, a picture going on in your life. Now you do. Get right and be right with God. And then I wrote down this, desire to obey, get help. Get help, and come back to that in a second. And then, hey, if you're in the middle of this, trust God for a good result. Trust God to do what only he can do in restoring, in fixing this disaster that's in front of you. I'm going to trust God for a good result. Well, so what? So what? We've, we've covered a big topic in 41 minutes. And I don't pretend to think that I've exhausted all that has to be said about this. But rather thought to give you a framework for you to be thinking and working out and growing in your faith. You may need help to work through some things. Uh, you need to first get to the Lord and be on your face before God. You need to be crying out in prayer to him. You need to be asking God for grace to do things that you couldn't even imagine you have the grace to do. You might have to do some things because you know it's what God's word tells you to do and allow the feelings and all the rest of the heart part to catch up with it. But you need to go to the Lord you need to go to the Lord. But you might need help. You might need help. You might need to uh, be honest with somebody in your small group. Uh, you might need to have your whole small group be praying for you and helping you in this. You, you might need to call the church. Uh, we might need to get someone else to come alongside you in a biblical counseling role to help you for, towards restoration and and how God can work in these strongholds that are, that are causing some of these things that, that they, they would be dealt with and, and you would be released from sin as one of the members of, the, of this couple and, and see God working for his glory. Get help. How is trying to do it on your own working out so far? Get help. Get help. And then commit to doing what God has directed you to do. In all of these things, don't be looking for a way out, but rather to discover if there is a way back. And maybe at the end of this message, you're like, I am so messed up in what I've done here. Does this church even love me? And you need to understand, first of all, God loves you, and he cares for you, and he wants things to be right between you and him, and that's where this needs to start. But you need to know that this church loves you, and we care for you, and we wanna help you and support you and help you through this to God's glory in all of this. How hypocritical it is for me to stand at an end of a service and say, you are loved, you are loved, if when you're going through this, you aren't loved regardless of where you are and the situation you're in, we love you and we care for you. And our desire as a church is how do we build one another up and help one another and encourage one another even the more as we see the day approaching. So as big of a failure or little of a failure you might find yourself to be in this, you are loved. You are loved by God and you are loved by God's people and together we will strive for God's glory in all of this. 
for the fame of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today. Man, Lord, when you lay it out, you lay it out clear. Jesus deals with anger, and then he deals with adultery and lust, and then he deals with divorce, just bam, 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 one right after the other. But Father, it's truth. It's all truth. It's your word. It's been laid out by our Savior for us. Give us hearts, God. Lord, I pray for the person who is so devastated in all of this in our church right now that you would come alongside and you would help them, you would encourage them. Lead us, God, to know how we can support them, encourage them. For the person who's found themselves in sin and feels so much shame and doesn't even want to come to church anymore, Lord, the, the release and the forgiveness and the hope there is in Jesus Christ is for them. And then, Lord God, I pray that you would guide each one of us who might even become a little pious in this it's not my thing. Why did they do that? You hate that, God. You hate that, taught us in Proverbs. So Lord, do the work that's needed and do it for your glory in your church. We pray in Jesus' name.